You know, I think there are not too many things in computer science that are legitimately surprising and legitimately eye-opening. And we're going to talk about one of them tonight, the Y Combinator, or the ability to copy yourself and thereby create recursive functions, underlies all of computer science because it sort of is the heart of insight between how we jump from the finite case of handling sort of pieces of finite structure to the infinite, or at least arbitrarily large, right? If you had to program in a language without loops, it would be so challenging. You wouldn't be able to say anything interesting because at the heart of our code, most of the time when we're programming something, we're doing something very similar and over and over on some arbitrarily large data type that we construct using systematic principles. And that's the key thing we're gonna talk about tonight. How do we actually build or enable recursion within the Lambda calculus? So let's dive into it and see. All right, so in the last lecture, we talked about how to encode most of scheme in the Lambda calculus. However, there was one form that I left out, and it's letrec. That's the thing that allows us to construct recursive loops. Now, tonight in lecture, we're going to talk about how do we actually encode letrec, and it turns out it's actually dead simple if you actually know what to do, but the construction is not so obvious. So that's what we're going to spend our time talking about. Now, I will say, uh, you should pull right now the corresponding exercise. I'm gonna list it right at the bottom of the screen for everybody following along, and you can clone that and then get points for this exercise on the auto grader as we go through. Now, we talked about how to encode most forms of scheme into the lambda calculus. We talked about, for example, let was a left left lambda where you take a lambda and immediately apply for all of these body expressions. And then lambdas, just become themselves, except the multi-argument cases have to get blown out to be curried. And this, we have to do the same thing, of course, for application for multiple arguments. Variables just become themselves. If gets encoded according to the structure that we talked about last time. And then we talked about how to encode several different primitive functions. But the one thing that I didn't show you how to do was letrec, which allows us to construct recursive loops. Now, whenever I was learning about how to program, I always felt like, well, letrec is the really interesting part. It's the interest, it's the part where you're actually doing computation of some arbitrary size. It's not very hard for me to believe that you can encode most of these other sort of finite operations in the lambda calculus. That just seems like something I'd expect you might be able to do. But it seems very non-obvious. How could we actually encode arbitrary amounts of computation using just a finite amount of code? That's such a cool idea, and that's the thing that we're going to focus on in this lecture. All right, so letrec is going to allow us to define names recursively. So for example, right here, I have this definition for letrec f, and I say it's a function that takes some lambda x, and then if x is equal to 0, it's going to return 1. Otherwise, it's going to return x times f of x sub 1. All right, so this function f can refer to itself throughout this definition right here because we have allowed ourselves using letrec to refer to this f within its definition. If we use a regular let, we're going to get a syntax error because we can't use this recursive name that we're defining f inside a regular let, but we can with letrec. So letrec will let us define recursive functions. And you're pretty much only going to want to use letrec when you're defining functions that are going to be recursive. There's no real point in using letrec to construct just a regular piece of data. You really are going to want to be using it for defining recursive functions and building loops out of them. So here we're defining the, um, the uh, factorial function and we're calling it on 20, all right? And we can see that unlike let, letrec is actually going to allow us to reference f within its definition. So if we replace this with a, uh, with a let, this is going to throw a syntax error. But because we have letrec here, we can actually bind f and use it within this uh, definition of the function itself. All right. So in today's class, we're going to see how can we use a regular let. All right. So unlike let, let rec is going to let us use this definition of f within its definition and to perform a desugaring into the lambda calculus the lambda calculus doesn't have let rec however we saw that in the lambda calculus if we can desugar something to just using let well then that's just a left left lambda or an application of a lambda all right so we're going to see how can we transform let rec just to using let plus one other argument all right so we're going to see how we can do that within this lecture 
All right, so I'm gonna work through the first part of the exercise. So this is just asking us to use letrec to define the Fibonacci function with some X, and I've got it stubbed out here. So the, uh, the assignment wants us to use letrec to do this, so let's just do that. So we're going to say our argument X here is gonna be the number of which we wanna take the Fibonacci sequence. So we're gonna say cond, and then we're gonna say um, when X is equal to uh, zero, then the Fibonacci number is going to be one. Otherwise, when x is equal to 1, that's going to be 1. Else, it's going to be uh, the sum of fib of x minus 1, and then fib of x minus 2. And note, this is going to work because it's all in a let rec. So this fib right here is referring to this definition right here that we're giving within the let rec. Uh, and then we're using the definition to actually define this whole outer function fib using letrec. So now let's see if it works. We'll run, get rid of that extraneous Q that I just inserted there, and we'll run uh, fib using letrec, and then let's just try 10, uh, looks correct. All right, so we're gonna be introducing this magic term. I'm gonna discuss to you precisely how it works, but here's what we're going to be able to do once we introduce this magic term named y. We're going to be able to take functions that are defined using letrec, where they have some lambda x, and then we have to do one trick to them. First, we're going to abstract them over the function itself, lambda f, so we always add an extraneous, uh, we're not an extraneous, but an extra, lambda, so we're going to parameterize this entire definition right here on the function f, and then we're going to wrap it in a call to this term y. And y is what's called a fixed point combinator. It's the thing that's going to pass the function to itself and close it up in the right way to make it a fixed point loop or make it a recursive function. So you can think of y as just this kind of magic term that we're going to discuss how it works to then get us the right behavior so that then we can transform this let rec just to an application of y and then note we've also changed something else. We've also abstracted the entire definition around f. Right, so we started with this whole lambda x, and now we're going to end up with an application of y to this lambda f, where then we've taken this entire lambda x that was here previously, abstracted it over this lambda f. All right, so if this doesn't make sense to you right now, do not worry, you, not, you should not be expected to understand it quite yet, but by the end of the lecture, this is the trick that we're going to see. This is basically the upshot. If you watch nothing else in this lecture, you just have to understand the trick is that you just add another lambda in front for the lambda f, the name that you're binding, and then you apply this magic term called y, all right, the y combinator. And I'm going to discuss precisely how the y combinator works and what it is and how we can systematically derive it. But this is the only upshot of this lecture. So if you're working on P2 right now, you're trying to solve let rec case, the real answer is you add another lambda and then you apply y. And I'll tell you precisely what y is through this lecture. And we're gonna discuss precisely how y works, but you do not have to understand precisely how y works. And in fact, most of the time when I use y, I don't really think about it too much. I just use it and then I remember that I've derived it a few times. But we're gonna walk through the definition carefully. So if you had to do it, you could, all right? And uh, just so you know what this term looks like, uh, this is what it is right here. So. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's pretty impenetrable looking if you just kind of look at it, but we're gonna discuss precisely why it works the way it does. So we're gonna start with a little bit of a simpler thing called, uh, called the U combinator. So first we're gonna define this U combinator as lambda x, x applied to x. So U is a combinator that if you give it some term, it will apply that term to itself. And this is actually the heart of recursion. The idea of self-application or calling yourself is the key concept involved in actually making recursion work, all right? So the U combinator is this idea that lets us do something super crucial. It's going to let us apply a term to itself, which is then going to, as we'll see, enable recursion, all right? And you may remember the U combinator is a piece, one piece of the omega term, right? Because the omega term is just U applied to U, all right? It's lambda X, X applied to X, applied to lambda x, x applied to x. And so it shouldn't necessarily be so surprising that the place that we're going to start to construct loops in the lambda calculus is the u combinator because the omega combinator, which includes two copies of u, u applied to u, is the sort of most obvious, non-productive, non-terminating loop that we can write in the lambda calculus as we've seen in the past few lectures. 
All right, so let's say that I didn't have LATREC. Let's say I'm programming in a language where I didn't pay for LATREC. How could I actually implement recursion without having LATREC? Let's say I just had let. So here's the key idea. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add an extra parameter to the function. And this parameter is going to be sort of like a recipe for creating a copy of the function f. All right, so I'm gonna call this parameter make f. It's another parameter, it sits out in front of this first lambda, and what this function is gonna be is that when I call it with itself, it's going to give me back another copy of the function that I want to run. So now I cannot just call f at this call site anymore. Previously I was able to call f of 20 when I was using let rec. But to actually kick the whole process off, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass f to itself, which is gonna sort of initiate the entire process of then taking this entire lambda right here, passing the entire lambda to itself, thereby making make f the entire lambda of make lambda make f again. And that way, when I take this inner call right here, when I call make f of make f of x, what that's gonna do if we think carefully, is sort of cook us up another copy of the recursive function to call. So now, instead of f being a recursive function, it's a function that takes some function make f and then uses that to construct a function. And the key idea here, the key concept, is that when we set it up this way, if we call this function on itself, everything is just gonna work out to give us recursion. Because when we now make this recursive call here, and of course we also have to fix up the recursive calls now because we can't just call f right here. We have to call f on itself because remember if we just called f, that would be this entire lambda make f right here. So when we call make f on itself, that's gonna sort of cook us up another copy. And what we're doing is we're sort of like giving one piece of the function when we execute the function, the next time it wants another copy of its function to call, well, all it does is it calls it on itself, gets another copy, all right? So that's how this whole process works. Let's see why it works. When we start executing f of f, well, that's gonna take this entire lambda right here. It's gonna apply it on itself, and then that's just gonna give us back this lambda x, where when we execute it, when we get to this make f of make f right here, it's gonna call, to create another function only at that point and then give us another copy to execute. And that is the key idea involved here. All right, so if you the, the Y Combinator stuff does get fairly complicated, but just this process, if you don't understand this, you have no hope of understanding the Y Combinator. So just understanding this idea of being able to code things up recursively using the U Combinator is the place we're going to start, all right? So first, we apply F to itself. The lambda goes away, it returns us this lambda x with make f bound to make f. So this initial call right here makes the first copy closed over itself, all right? Second, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna apply that lambda, that entire lambda x to 20, which is then going to actually execute this lambda right here, take us down the false branch, all right? which is then going to, in computing the false branch, call make f on itself, all right? And note, it's only at that point that make f gets called again, which is this entire lambda right here, and that's going to then call it on itself, which is then going to give us another copy of this lambda x. And because we put this make f right here, that's how we got the same exact function back. If we put some other function here, like add one, we would get a different behavior. In general, if we want this to work out this way to get recursion, we're always going to want to pass it to itself because we want to do the same thing over and over again, all right? And then last, we apply that function again. Finally, we get down to the base case and we bottom out, all right? So this is the U combinator recipe for recursion. Whenever we have something that's a let rec of an F and then some lambda X with some E body and then some let rec body, we can always systematically trans that, translate that into a form that just uses let by wrapping this entire lambda x right here in another lambda f and then changing occurrences of f within the body to apply f to itself, right? Because remember, now we've got another lambda f there. And then we apply the u combinator that applies the function to itself to actually kick the whole process off. And now we don't need let rec anymore. We can just use a normal let, all right? And as I've said previously, if you don't quite understand how this process works, and it's understandable if you don't, 
you should just think through very carefully precisely how is this working. So let's walk through a few examples and we'll see precisely how, but I'll just sort of show you right now, we can take this let rec right here, we've got this F, all we're gonna do to get rid of the let rec is going to translate that into a use of let, where we have the same binding for F, except we apply the U combinator to another lambda F. But we have to do one crucial thing, like I said in the last few slides, we can't just use f anymore because now f is parameterized by this next lambda f that we just inserted right here. And so we need to, instead of having f, we need to apply f on itself. So any instance where we see f within this, uh, within this body, we need to instead replace that with a call of f on itself to get the next copy. All right, so that's the u combinator recipe for recursion. So now let's try the u combinator approach. So let's define this function length using u. So uh, u is going to pass us a lambda f, and now we actually want this entire thing to be a function. So we're calling u on the lambda f, so the lambda x right here is going to be, the x is going to be the argument we're actually going to receive. So this is actually going to be the list that we're going to be operating on. And then the u is going to apply f to itself to then fix up this definition. So we're gonna have this lambda list right here and we're going to say if empty huh list, well then we're just going to return zero because the length of the empty list is zero. Otherwise we're going to return add one of uh, the rest of the list. So f on the rest of the list right there and then we'll close that if, we'll close that f, close the u, and then we'll take the entire thing, and then let's just see if this one works. So this is length using u, and then let's pass in, well, let's say range of zero to 100. Uh, and no, that's not correct, I made a mistake. So what mistake did I make? Well, within this definition here, it can't just be f because that would be the let rec definition. Now that we're using the u combinator, f is not just a function, it's a function that accepts another function. So to get the next recursive call, what we're gonna do is we're going to call f on itself. And then we're going to kick the entire process off by, uh, well, we've done that by calling u on this entire lambda. So if we didn't have the u right here, we would have to do something like call lin on lin, but since we've closed it over using the u combinator, which applies this lambda f to itself, so it's gonna apply this lambda f to the lambda f, we're gonna get the right behavior here. So let's see what happens. So now let's do length using u, and then range of zero to 100, and this is just a function that generates a list uh, with that number of elements. And it gives us list uh, length 100. All right, so it looks like we did it right. All right, so now let's look at another example. We're going to define the Fibonacci function using the U combinator. So I have the U combinator applied to some F, and this is the exact same format that all of our functions using the U combinator are going to use. It's always going to be U applied to lambda F, and then some lambda X, and remember that lambda X is the actual argument that's going to get passed to the entire function. The lambda f is just sort of like a recipe for creating the recursive function. When we apply the u combinator to that lambda f, the u combinator is going to apply it to itself and sort of close the loop in some sense, giving us the recursive function. That's what the u combinator is doing. So we apply u to lambda f, and now we need our arguments. So now we're gonna do lambda x, and now we're just going to say, um, now let's do a cond, and let's say, um, if x is equal to uh, zero, then we're going to return one. Otherwise, if x is equal to one, then we're gonna return one. Otherwise, we're going to return uh, f of x minus one, and then f of x minus two. And then let's close this all up and see if it works. And now we'll do fib using u, and now fib using u on, let's say 20. All right, uh, and that doesn't look correct because I still made a mistake. I did the same exact thing I did last time. So we've got to plot f on itself. And that's because we've got another uh, another 
by calling f on itself, what we're doing is we're getting rid of this next lambda f. And so then we're getting the sort of the next copy of f, right? We're going to see in a few minutes how when we use the y combinator, we're actually not going to have to do this. And then we're going to be able to write it this normal way. That's the magic of the y combinator. But to sort of conceptually understand what the y combinator is doing, it sort of helps to start at this simpler case where the u combinator, which is going to sort of force us to rewrite these inner functions to then call f on itself. So now let's see, I fixed up the definition. We'll do fib using u and we'll call it on 20. Yeah, it looks like the 20th Fibonacci number to me. All right. All right. Now, one thing that you've been seeing me make a whole bunch of mistakes on for sure is uh, that when you rewrite the function to using the u combinator, you have to switch calls of f to then call it on itself. All right. So the y combinator is going to allow us not to have to do that. We're still going to have to add this extra lambda f in front, but then any time that f is called within the body, if we use the y combinator, we're going to be able to get just a true fixed point without having to change the function's definition. All right, so we're going to be able to just write y applied to all of this uh, stuff right here. Oops, sorry, I already had it right here. So we're going to be able to define f and then to actually call it, we're just going to be able to apply this magic term y to it without having to change any of these inner definitions right here. All right, so let's think for a few seconds. If we were going to take f so that then we could perform this strategy, what would f have to be? What law would f have to satisfy? And if you think about it for a few seconds, what you're going to realize is that we need the following equality. We need y of f to be equal to f of y of f. So that every time we call f, we essentially get another copy of itself. All right? So this actually gives us the intuition for how we can actually derive the y combinator. So let's start by taking this as the definition. Let's just say y of f has to be equal to f of y of f. All right, so we're going to assume that's the fact that we want. Well, now, if we treat that as the definition, we can sort of factor f across the equal sign by saying, well, now y equals lambda f, f y of f. So here, when we've gone from this equation to this equation, what we've done is we've just done sort of the sort of eta observation. We've sort of seen via extensionality, well, if we've got f of y of f equals f of y of f, we can add this extra lambda here and then cancel sort of for the f and get this y back, all right? Unfortunately, if we use this definition, this is a totally valid definition of the y combinator, but it turns out it doesn't work in call by value languages because if you try to use this, when you actually perform this call right here, you're going to run into an infinite loop. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to lift y to this term make y or my. And so we're going to actually translate that to add in another my. We're going to leave this all the same, except we're going to change this definition of uh, y right here to then be a self-application of my to my. And then to avoid this problem with call by value not terminating, what we're going to do is we're going to eta expand this entire definition because when we call f on itself right here, using the call by value definition, this part of the definition will not terminate. However, it will if we wrap the entire thing in a lambda and then call it on itself. All right. So this is sort of the process for how we derive a make y, which is going to give us the sort of root for the y combinator. But then if we actually want the entire y combinator, what we're going to do is we're going to take that make y, and then we're just going to apply it to itself, and then we're going to get the full definition of the y combinator. So the full definition of the y combinator is going to be, according to that process, it's going to be taking this entire make y and then calling it on itself. So it's going to be the u combinator applied to lambda my, lambda f, f, lambda x, and then all of my, my, f applied to x. All right, so this definition definitely takes a few minutes to get through. You have to think through it a few times if it's the first time sort of seeing it. But I think if you walk through the steps, you will be able to understand what's, uh, what's sort of going on. All right. All right, so now that we've derived the y combinator, we can happily use it. The y combinator is just make y, this term to make y, applied to itself, and that gives us a call by value fixed point combinator y. 
So we take this magic term y, which is written out really nicely here. We've got lambda x, x applied to x, plus this entire thing, which came from our make y equation in the last slide, except I'm changing a few of the variables. And now that we have that definition, we can actually use it to write recursive definitions in exactly this style. Let's go work through a few different examples. First, let's write the definition of the Fibonacci function using the Y Combinator. And it's pretty easy. It's actually easier than the U Combinator. Once you actually have the Y Combinator, once I give you a Y Combinator, and I am never going to force you to derive the Y Combinator on an exam, don't worry about that. But once you have the Y Combinator, you can use it very easily. You're just going to have this lambda F, and then you're going to give a lambda x, that's the same argument as before, that's gonna be the argument to the recursive function you'd wanna define. And you're now going to want to say cond, um, so it's gonna be the fib function. We're gonna say when x is equal to one, return one. Otherwise, um, when x is equal to, uh, when x is equal to zero, also return one. Uh, else, return f of x minus one, and then f of x minus 2. All right, and let's see if this works. We'll call fib of x and test this out. And oops, what did I mess up here? Oops, I think I don't need that parentheses. Need to delete one here. All right, let's see if this one works. And now fib using y and uh, 10. All right, 89, that's the correct answer. So now let's work through another example. Let's write uh, sum, which is the sum of a list of numbers using the y combinator. All right, so this is going to be y of uh, applied to lambda f, because remember we need to define the function by passing another function that's going to get instantiated via the y combinator to be this function f. We're gonna close f over itself. And so now we need a lambda x, which is going to be the actual argument we care about. That's going to be a list in this case. So let's call it lambda lst. And now let's say uh, if empty ha huh, lst just return zero because the length of the, or the sum of the empty list is zero. Otherwise, it's going to be plus of first of LST, and then uh, I guess F applied to rest of LST. And then I think that's just our answer. Let's see and test and find out if it works. So we're going to do some using Y of maybe range of zero to 100. And great, well, okay, I'm gonna give you some closing words of advice. I do think this stuff is genuinely confusing. I think if you don't understand how the U Combinator stuff works, you have no hope of understanding how the Y Combinator works. But I have good news for you. You don't have to understand how the Y Combinator works. You just have to understand how you use the Y Combinator. To do project two, you don't have to understand any of this nuanced, tricky stuff about what the Y Combinator is doing or what it means. You just have to know if you Im implement and want to hit a let rec, you translate that into a let where you then take the Y Combinator applied to some lambda F over whatever that function is, right? So check through the video and make sure that you can actually do that process. But once you can do that process, you're all golden. You don't need to understand how the Y Combinator works. I think it's nice to be able to understand how to derive it. And I think if you can dedicate the time to thinking about how it works, it really is kind of illuminative. But the real thing that I would say to practice, because this is going to be a learning objective for the course, is learning how to write recursive functions using the U Combinator. Once you can do that, learning how to write them using the Y Combinator is also easy. All right. So good luck as we wrap up project two. This should hopefully give you all the information you need. Uh, otherwise, reach out on Slack and I'm totally happy to help. All right. Thanks so much.